Hello everybody. Hello everyone. Uh, this is a video of me going to go through gambling addiction. We are joined by Candy who has decided this is the time she wants to clean the lampshade. Hello everyone. Um, so today we are going to be going through gambling addiction. Um, a pretty big bullet point, uh, a tough bullet point actually. Um, as with nicotine, um, we uh, are going to be looking at two theories in this case. We're going to be looking at learning theory as applied to gambling, as well as cognitive theory. Both of these you already know. Both of these we've looked at before. Um, uh, <clears throat> this time we're just applying it to gambling in this case. Now, what actually is uh, well, problem gambling? Um uh, it's defined as uh, yeah. um, such an attention seeker. Um, uh, basically, a repeated pattern of gambling behavior where someone feels like they have lost control. Um, they continue to gamble despite the negative consequences of like always losing money, um, betting more than you can afford. Uh, and they see gambling as more important to them than any other interest or activity. Why have AQA looked at gambling? I think it's because gambling is an inc probably one of the biggest growing addiction concerns among the youth, such as such as yourselves. Um, uh, particularly, gambling adverts aimed at uh, males who like sport. Um, it typically is males who like sport. It typically is people who who likes. Sorry, it's typical. Typically, males who like sport in the sense of that seems to be the you know uh, that seems to be the most vulnerable group of people in terms of addiction. Females arguably have a bit more control, especially females who who like who like sport. So. Problem gambling is an increasing problem. Uh, one in a hundred people have a gambling disorder, and a further four to seven people in every hundred are at risky levels that become a problem in the future. Now, personally, I am not a big drinker. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I I am addicted to caffeine, admittedly, quite badly, and my phone is is right there. So mm -hmm. I guess I have that addiction. But for me, my biggest problem is gambling and I stay well away from that right so I don't gamble I never have had a, a, a problem with gambling but in the past when I've gambled I can feel myself being pulled in I can feel myself being pulled into that like addictive nature of wanting to do it upping the stakes for example that was always a problem for me up the stakes up the stakes up the stakes and that thrill you get from it so whilst it is a problem I do actually understand it it is, and it's a it's a weird one. This one because it's not a substance disorder, is it? It's it's not a substance addiction. In this case, it's a behavioural addiction. So you do need to know the difference between a substance addiction and a behavioural addiction. And um, gambling is probably the main behavioural addiction, I would say. So we're going to be looking at how uh, how gamblers think, which is fascinating to me um, but we're also going to be looking at the learning approach quick video here for you to watch uh, so you might want to click on that link to if you can to have a look but the first thing we're going to look at is gambling addiction so <clears throat> uh, learning theory of gambling addiction you know this you know this already the first thing we're going to talk about is classical conditioning uh, and this is in your workbooks um, so you might want to get that out but um it's pretty obvious, right? You need to know how they associate with each other. And I'm going to use an example of playing with a fruit machine. A fruit machine, should you not know it, are those machines that you see in the pub um, where you have little nudge buttons and things like that. And, you know, um, uh, you win and the lights go off and you get applause and you think, oh, I'm really special. And then you, you hear the money hit the metal coins, hit the metal a tray so it makes a loud sound and everyone looks around and thinks ah you you've just won maybe I can go win for example it's all this psychology that gambling companies do now the first thing here you need to know what the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response is now um, this is pre pairing this is pre uh, association uh, and in this case the unconditioned stimulus will always have an effect 
of an unconditioned uh, response. So playing or winning at the machine will always lead to excitement, will always lead to excitement. But what do you pair the unconditioned stimulus with? The neutral stimulus in this case, which initially promotes no response. So the neutral stimulus at this, uh, before pairing, initially promotes no response. And that is just sitting at the fruit machine. If I were to take you, who hopefully don't have a gambling disorder, and sit you in front of a fruit machine, you get no excitement at all. You get no thrill of that. If I were to take you and put you in a casino, right, you, you don't have any associations there. You might, you, you're not going to have the thrill of it. So the neutral stimulus at the beginning does not promote these feelings. Now, during conditioning, what you start to do is you start to pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. So these two that's on the left-hand side, you start to pair them together, sitting at the fruit machine and winning at the fruit machine. And you start to pair that kind of, ex it, it, that excitement essentially, that, sorry, that neutral stimulus um, gets paired with the unconditioned response. I don't know what I was saying before, it's been a long day. But the neutral stimulus being at the fruit machine slowly starts to get associated with these feelings of excitement as you win. And that's what happens during the uh, pairing. So that afterwards, this is what happens. All you have to do is sit at the machine and you will get excited. You play at the machine and you get excited. It's not even about winning anymore. And remember, the conditioned stimulus will always have a conditioned response without thought, without thinking, without processing. Playing at, playing at machine will always lead to uh, physiological arousal and excitement. So that's the classical conditioning. And yes, you do need to know those uh, terms, uh, unconditioned stimulus, neutral stimulus. You need to know what the neutral stimulus is. You need to know that the conditioned stimulus always has a conditioned response. But that's the classical conditioning. What I also want to talk about here is the operant conditioning. And obviously you're being rewarded for your behaviors financially by getting money, but for gambling. So operant conditioning is also another AO1 that you do want to bring in. So winning a bet or seeing money fall out the fruit machine acts as reinforcement and you know, we get a pleasurable feeling of winning a bet. Now, there's, a, there's loads of other bits associated with this, but I think they're all um, uh, kind of coming later, so I'll carry on. Uh, slot machines act as reinforcement by playing cheers and clapping sounds when you win. You feel rewarded. You feel special. Everyone's looking at you being like, oh, jackpot, mate, brilliant, or whatever accent or where, wherever you are. Um, and this is positive reinforcement. You do a behavior, you get rewarded for it. That's positive reinforcement in this case. Um, however, the obvious argument here is, well, people lose all the time. And surely that's punishment. Surely if you're constantly getting punished, you're not going to get addicted. So why is it, why is this constant state of losing not enough to stop or extinguish the behavior? The reality is, is that two things, firstly, um, Cognitive biases don't, they make you inattend. So you basically, you focus in on the wins and you kind of forget about the losses. You, you kind of, you kind of sweep them under the carpet or you see near misses as near wins. So with betting, you either win or lose. There's no middle ground. But there's no middle ground if you either win or lose. But if some people, you know, nearly, you know, uh, win a bet, if they nearly uh, get some money, they see that as an almost win, not a, a loss, which it is. The other thing here to note down, again, quite an important point, is that the losses tend to be a lot smaller, but more frequent than the wins, which tend to be bigger and rarer. So if I were to bet on, I don't know, like uh, something nine to one. I, I bet on something nine to one to, to happen. In that case, what the nine to, what what nine to one means is if I put one pound down and I win the bet, I get nine pound back. They're quite long odds, by the way. They're, they're quite unlikely going to happen. But if I put one pound down, that's just one pound. That's fine. I can do that. I tell you what, one pound is a pathetic number. If I put a hundred quid down. 
I could win £900 back. Now, if I put £100 down, that sucks. I've lost, okay, but I could have won £900. So I'm going to put another £100 down. I'm going to put another £100 down. I could put another £100 down. The lot... The losses are a lot smaller than the wins could be. So all of those things together um, <clears throat> kind of come together. The other thing I do want to talk to you about here as well is um, what's called time contiguity. Um, time, con time contiguity refers to the extent to which you are reinforced for a behavior after the event. So if you win straight away, if you win straight away, if you get rewarded straight away from doing your behavior, then you're going to be rewarded. You, you, you're going to know that's good. If you're punished a long time afterwards, then you're not going to necessarily link the punishment to the behavior. So, for example, if you if you slowly build up your losses, you're not learning quick enough. You're not learning quick enough. So for, let me give you an example. Um, drinking. Um with alcohol, a lot of people drink alcohol on a night out, for example, because they get the rewards straight away. They feel a little bit buzzed. They're being sociable. They're, they're you know, out with mates and stuff like that. The punishment, i.e. the hangover, is the next day. That's ages away, for example. And people fail to link the hangover to their actual drinking. I know, obviously, we know that's where we get it from. But because you're not being punished straight away, let me ask you this. If you were drink on a night out, and as you were drinking, you were getting drunk, but also getting hungover at the same time, would you do it? Most people wouldn't. Most people wouldn't because you're being punished straight away. If you're punished straight away for a behavior, if it has time contiguity, that's a really powerful reinforcer. Now, if you win something in gambling, you win it straight away. So it has time contiguity. The problem with the losses, because they are so small, you don't realize you're losing. You're not you know, you still have money to bet, for example, or oh, the next bet might come in. And so you don't get punished straight away for losing your bets. So gambling has time contiguity only for wins, not for losses. This is where it gets a little bit, a uh, little bit more confusing. As we know, Skinner worked with rats and pigeons and demonstrated that continuously reinforcing uh, the behaviour does not always lead to persistent behaviour. It's stronger in some aspects, but um, once the rewards were stopped, that behaviour that you were rewarding immediately stops. For example, when we see as in prisoners, if you're constantly rewarded for good behaviour in prison and then you get released, you're going to walk out and be like, I didn't stab anyone today. Where, where's my reward? And I go, sorry, this is the real world. You don't get rewards for not stabbing people. And so, right, okay, well, I'm going to stab someone then. So <clears throat> once you take the rewards away from a continuous reinforcement schedule, the behaviors often do stop. On the other hand, with partial reinforcement, um, this in some aspects, can be quite effective in producing this consistent and persistent behavior. So for example, bets are not always rewarded. You're always thinking, ah, oh, the next bet, the next bet is gonna win, the next bet is gonna win, the next bet is gonna win. And even if you're on a losing streak, you think, well, that, that losing streak's got to end soon. So <clears throat> this unpredictable nature keeps gamblers interested in the fact in the face of the fact that they are losing money left, right and centre. So partial reinforcement tends to be quite effective. And this is where it, you need to know four. So there's, you know the learning theory already, but there's a lot of elements added to this. Um, so you, there are four in reinforcement schedules you need to know. And this is new for um, gambling behaviour. We haven't looked at this before because this is quite specific to gambling. And it is confusing, so I'm just going to slow this down a little bit. So there's four reinforcement schedules, fixed ratio, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval. So I'm going to go through one, and I'd just like to think which one is the more powerful in this case. So the first response, so the first bet, if you will, the first bet after a given interval of time is reinforced 
So for example, let's think of fruit machine. Um, to how often will they pay out? How often will they let the person win? Basically, is what we're talking about here. And fixed interval is the first response after a time interval, so five minutes. So um, uh, after after five minutes, the first person to bet wins. After next five minutes, first person to bet wins. After first, now everyone in between that five minutes loses. Right, but that's fixed interval. You are doing it at you. You are letting people win at a fixed interval. Fixed ratio is every event, every every nth bet may be reinforced. So if every twenty fifth play may be reinforced. Every twenty fifth like um, bet may be won, for example. Um, now. Is that going to be effective? Gamblers will be able to work that out pretty quickly. They will count, and this is how gamblers work, they will count out how many times people lose before they win. And so all they have to do is wait around for like 22, 23 goes and let people fail, kick them off and be like, right, I'm going to go now because this is about to win. So that's not really particularly effective. The other ones are a bit more confusing. Uh, variable interval. On average, the first response after a given interval of time is reinforced, but this time interval varies. So it could be five minutes one day, 25 minutes the next day. The gambler cannot know. And then finally, every... I forgot it says most powerful down the bottom. So there you go. This one's the most powerful. Every nth number is reinforced. Right, and this is where it gets a bit confusing. Every nth Every nth number is, you know, every 25th um, response is paid out. But the gap between the reinforcement varies and be quite large. So it says here, consider a fruit machine that pays out 25% of the time. However, it's not every 25th time. It's, you know, it's sometimes you win within a short space of time. But other times there's a long winless streak. The gambler finds that the most appealing in terms of, winning in terms of it's it's in terms of their desire to keep playing because they constantly think um if for example they are um if they're winning they might think oh i'm on i'm on a winning streak you know they keep going keep going keep going but if they're on a long winless streak and they're they're betting they're betting they're betting they're, they're thinking this streak is around the corner Keep betting, keep betting, keep betting. So you see how the gambler gets locked in a in a, in a way of thinking here. So this is key A O one. You need to know that a uh, rate variable ratio is the most effective and the most powerful way to teach gamblers to be gamblers. Now <clears throat> I've said this already, so we don't need to worry too much about that. Big wins and small losses. In terms of valuation, there is some research support. So you got Dick and, uh, Dickerson just here found that horse racing gamblers often waited until the last two minutes before a race started to place a bet, um, which is significantly later than non-regular gamblers. And it's thought that 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 prolonging that prolonging of will they won't they means if they better the last minute and they win then that's quite a rewarding sensation apparently i i didn't really see the appeal of that personally but does it really explain everything i mean the the issue is here uh, it doesn't explain all types of gambling so skill in poker is more important than luck or chance poker's uh, very skill-based gain it requires a lot of human skill for example we'll come on to that in a second but games like poker do not possess time contiguity you don't win straight away you don't win in terms of winning you get you win the hand straight away but you don't win the game straight away when i used to play poker kind of 15 years ago um we used to play for like eight nine hours we used to play till four or five o'clock in the morning that's a long time to wait for a win so some gambling doesn't have time contiguity. But, and there's another one here as well, individual differences. And as always, there is not a model answer here. That was a test. Um, so let's move on to gambling. Uh, cognitive, sorry, cognitive explanations. I'm all over the place today. It's been awful. Um, this I find fascinating. Um, gamblers think differently. 
gamblers think differently. They and I speak from experience um, when I when I used to gamble. Um, you need to know the many faults a gambler has with the way they process information. Um, <clears throat> so these are four suggestions to begin with. So Rick Wood in 2010 uh, suggested that gamblers have four different cognitive distortions. Um, there's quite a lot under the faulty perceptions, by the way, and you do need to know this. It's it's, it's in your pack. Um, uh, if, oh, where is it? It's in your pack under the task 27. But um, so skill and judgment. Hmm, this makes me laugh because this is totally true. Um, gamblers tend to overestimate the amount of ability and control that they have. It's called the illusion of control, basically. So the illusion of control is more likely with fruit machines, which give the gambler a feeling of control with like features like nudge and hold, which don't really actually allow you to be more skillful. It's still luck. Fruit machine, there is no skill whatsoever. But if you add these little buttons, gamblers think they have control over their ability to actually win. Um, <clears throat> so p gamblers will overestimate their control and their ability. Gamblers generally think they are better um, than their actual ability. Um, I do this. right when I, when I bet on football, by the way, and football is something I used to bet on, I, I don't really do it anymore. I stay quite well away from it. But when I used to bet on football, I used to think, I know football. I'm a better gambler than most people in terms of betting on football because I know the way the scores are going to go. I know the teams. I know the form. I know the likelihood of winning. Um, and then I bet £100 on Man United to beat Wolves and I lost it. Uh, and Man United were top at the time, Wolves were bottom at the time, and uh, yeah, that that really opened up my eyes. Now, um, it's all luck, pretty much, to a large extent. Personal characteristics and rituals. Gamblers sometimes believe themselves to be naturally lucky people, or they engage in ritualistic behaviours prior to or during gambling, which they may believe, so wearing lucky pants or humming a particular song, holding a particular, like, uh, luck charm, if you will, um, and they believe, cognitively, they believe that that personal characteristic or that ritual influences how Man City play. It influences, you know, uh, what you are betting on. When clearly, rationally, take a step back, it does not. But gamblers do believe this. It's the same way that some people believe stepping on three drains is bad luck. Um, take a step back. Uh, and by the way, I am sort of one of these people that can't help but think that, um, it's just not true. It's just not true. The other thing as well is selective recall, which I have um, uh, told you about. They overestimate wins and underestimate losses, and they see big losses as totally inexplicable. A freak result. That would never happen again if, if I bet that much money again. So I'm going to do it to prove it. So their inability to explain big losses is huge. But when it's a huge win, I meant that. When it's a, when they win a lot of money, that's my skill. That's my skill. It's just it's just I'm a good gambler, right? But when they lose massive, they go, oh, wow, nothing I could have done. Uh, uh, I was going to get it, but this, this, you know, usually that person plays and he, he didn't play, so it's, you know, it's out my, it's not my fault, right? So, yeah, it's flexible attributions. Okay. Um, finally, faulty perceptions. Now, here's the bit that you need to know, the cognitive biases. You need to know the specific ways, the specific mistakes that people with gambling, uh, problem gambling addictions do. So the first one is what's called the gambler's fallacy. It's a couple of slight alterations on the definition here, but gambler's fallacy, a fallacy is a mistaken way of thinking. The idea that random events equal themselves out over time. I can't help but think this, but you know, an example, I haven't had a win for three months on the lottery, so it's, it's my turn soon, right? No. No, these things don't even themselves out. If you were to flip a coin, um, uh, <clears throat> well, actually, no, that's a terrible, that's a terrible example. Um, the other one is availability bias. Um, 
I'll tell you a very, very brief story. Um, I had a mate who I lived with a couple of years ago called Dave. He used to bet quite a lot. And when we used to go out for drinks, every now every now and again, he used to be like, oh, don't worry, lads. I've got the round. I've got this round. I'm on £400 at the football. And I always used to be like, ah, you jammy bastard. How have you won £400? And you're just paying for everyone's drink for such a baller move. And it would make me think... I know more about football than Dave. Surely I can win. Availability bias is you only see the big wins. You do not see the, the bigger losses. Uh, people will, uh, for example, um, with the lottery, you see that person holding a big check. They, and they're usually old and just think, Yo, I'm not going to have a long enough life to be able to spend all that money this is taking the mick um and they you got a champagne you're like what you're not seeing are the millions of people that lost that week you're looking at the people that won going maybe i can do it um that's availability bias you see the big wins but you don't see the mountain of losers um uh, in that particular week i don't know why this is doing this this is annoying me Another one, hindsight bias. Gamblers look at look back at big wins and big losses and say they expected it, right? The reason why they do this is because it makes them feel like they have control, right? Well, I'm sorry, mate, but if you knew that big loss was going to happen, why did you bet on it, right? I oh, would just, you know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, you did lose some. So hindsight bias is looking back at it and going, ah, yeah, I knew that was going to happen, Ugh. right? And flexible attribution, I've already told you, when they win, it's down to their skill. When they lose, it's down to factors outside of their control. So all of these fascinating things, the cognitive biases, write this down, the cognitive biases lock you in uh, irrational ways of thinking to make you keep uh, gambling, basically. And then the last one I've mentioned as well is the near miss bias. All of these are faulty cognitive perceptions. They're, they're mistaken ways of thinking. The other thing you have to write about here as well is self-medication. Now, I don't know if this is in the workbook, so you probably want to make a note of this. This is extra A01. But the approach assumes there are reasons for the person's choice of addiction. Um, although they don't set out with the intention of becoming addicted, there is a reason why alcohol is the choice of drug rather than cigarettes. Um, it might be a case that... Uh, people are gambling to relieve themselves of stress as in self-medication um, people gamble as a form of escapism uh, people gamble to make themselves feel good uh, maybe it's a self-esteem issue for example so you may write this down I personally think this is particularly um, uh, not particularly useful but as it says on the bottom there as well in the case of gambling, people might choose gambling specifically to help them overcome poverty or the boredom of everyday life. So a kind of a poor form of self-medication, really. OK, so why are you doing this? A couple of pieces of research. I've gone through this quite quickly. Um, there's loads of terms you need to know, obviously. Uh, Rogers examined cognitive bias and lottery ticket bias. People believed that they had some weird advantageous personal luck now that their numbers that they picked uh, they had you know because they picked them there was more chance they were going to come up and this this mistaken way of thinking the other piece of research you need to know which is a brilliant piece of research by the way is uh, Mark Griffiths's piece of research in the mid 90s he basically put gave some people lapel microphones and he he got them to do what's called the talking aloud technique so basically they had to go on these fruity machines they were given three pound he gave them to gamblers and non-gamblers so independent measures uh, independent groups um, and he, he got them to bet 60 times on a fruit machine now if they got through the 60 gambles, they could either keep the money or carry on. Everyone who did it carried on. Everyone who did it carried on. Nobody took the money and ran. Um, but Griffiths concluded a couple of things. Um, oh, sorry, before I go into this. Um, people who, they were asked to say every single thought that came into their head out loud so the microphone caught it. 
and then that was kind of uh, typed up, trans, uh, transcribed up. So basically what you're doing is, is you're trying to get people's cognitive thinking into the microphone. So what Griffiths found was gamblers are actually a little bit more skillful than non-gamblers, but gamblers think they are way more skillful than they actually are, significantly more skillful than they actually are. Gamblers make way more irrational verbalizations, including humanizing the machines more often. So they were th the machine was, they were kind of gambling on the machine, but they'd talk to the machine like, oh, come on, babe, don't do this to me. And they'd say like, oh, I want to go on that one because that one really likes me. It's like they're humanizing the machine. That's, that's a really weird cognitive thing to do. But gamblers do that. They humanize things. And for some reason, that makes them want to gamble a little bit more. Now, a couple of evaluations here, which I'm not going to go into. There's three there for you. Um, and there's a model peel just here, which I do need to improve, I think, was not particularly good. Um, in terms of questions, this is the sort of thing that might come up. Um, that bottom one, 2020. Discuss cognitive bias as a way of explaining gambling addiction. For the A01, you want to talk about, so A01 is three, you want to talk about four separate things so maybe describe what cognitive biases are in the context of gambling addiction and then maybe look at describing i'd say two or three in detail of those faulty perceptions that we talked about hindsight bias locks you in gambling uh, the near miss bias um, convinces people that you know the, the, uh, the next one will be a win because this one nearly was a win for example these faulty ways of thinking are keeping gamblers um, in a gambling state of mind and and making them inattend to their losses but they're paying attention to their wins they just ignore their losses and that's it that's it really so uh quite uh i don't know how long this went on for actually but um i i think this is a lot harder than nicotine addiction and nicotine addiction is actually a pretty tough bullet point this one i think is even harder because there's a lot of terminology you need a lot of uh evaluations that you know i could have gone through in a bit more detail but um that is it for gambling next up is how to reduce addiction um and uh, neither of them, well, none of them are nice, by the way, right? Reducing addiction is a really, really tough road to go down, particularly substance, drug. We're going to look mainly at mainly at drug uh, addictions here and how to cure them, namely, uh, mostly uh, smoking and heroin. Um, until then, peace out.